Well, folks, the October update for Gran Turismo 7 is now live. And for those who haven't come back to the game yet or haven't had the chance to update it, what can you expect? What's new? What's interesting? What's different? And what kind of update is it overall? Well, many of us have vented, myself included, about this update being, for the most part, kind of a letdown. The cars aren't particularly interesting for the most part. We had one extra car, which is curious, but they use the extra car instead of a circuit, which is much more annoying for many of us. And they have yet again adjusted the tire model, the suspension model, and the performance points, which they seem to do in every single update at this point. As far as the cars, we'll get to those in a second with my briefer thoughts, and then of course in the coming few days on the channel, I'll be doing those in-depth individual reviews, as I always like to do. For now though, the cars are a mixed bag. None of them are bad, but some are definitely better than others. There is no circuit to talk about, unfortunately. As I said, they have made some changes. They've added new career mode events here and there. Only a couple, a Group 1 event here, an 800-point event there, and of course some new actual cafe races, and a couple of new collections, like for the Sylvia, and you'll probably see some of those here in the video. Now, to get into the actual vehicles, I'm going to start off first of all by discussing the overall impression. I suspected that it was going to be between 1 and 2 million to buy all the cars. I was pretty much dead on, it's about 1.2. We have, of course, the Maserati Mirac SS, the newer shape Nismo GT3, the classic Skyline KGC 110 model, kind of a Japanese Dodge Challenger in mini form, and, of course, the most controversial of them all, the Mazda Cup Car Style NRA model. Now, first of all, let's start off with the only one of the four that is genuinely new and unique, and that is... The Maserati. It's not a returning face, it's not a variation or an update of any kind, it's a brand new car, and of course being a Maserati superfan, as I am, obviously I'm happy to see it here. What is it actually like to drive? Well first of all, let's talk price actually, because that's kind of crazy. In fact, you can completely flip, virtually, my predictions on what the prices of this and the Skyline were going to be, because they are the exact opposites. Instead of this being like 200 to 500,000, it's 75,000 credits, which is strangely cheap. Then on the other hand, the Skyline is way higher at 542,000. Very odd, and I don't really care if that's realistic or not, it's still a stupid price for that car. Now we'll get to the Skyline more in a second, but first of all, again to go back to the Maserati, it's got some interesting numbers. The points aren't that high, not too surprising, many of its rivals like the Mangusta aren't either. It's 422 points at the moment. It's a lot heavier than you'd think though, which is part of the reason why the points aren't that high. 1420 kilos is a lot heftier than it looks. Thankfully, it doesn't feel that heavy. It's much smaller, much lighter on its feet, and basically handles in the way that it looks. This nice, pleasant little classic sports car, or even supercar, you could say, maybe at a stretch. It's only got 216 horsepower, though, which is why I said it could be a stretch to call it a supercar, and it is, of course, mid-engine and naturally aspirated. Curiously, though, this is pretty cool, despite being naturally aspirated, you can turbocharge this car and get it up around the 400 horsepower region. So it could be something of a little weapon if you wanted to use it as such. Now, in terms of driving it, many people ask me about the Maseratis that I've owned and also why I love them so much. The reason is simple. I love that Maserati is deliberately and unabashedly different. They never try to be the fastest thing around, even when they make fast cars, and the only time that they really try to win is in actual motorsport. In their production models, they basically just design cars in the same way that Alfa Romeo does, for better or worse, and that is that they're not the most reliable thing around, but they're designed to be gorgeous, to sound great, and to be super passionate and charismatic, and incredibly fun and engaging to drive. Having owned two of them, compared to people who have opinions against them who've never even driven one, I can tell you that they do feel fantastic to drive, and this is no exception. It's super fun, definitely not the fastest in a straight line of the classics, but it more than makes up for it through corners, belies its weight for sure, and it's just a really nice new car to work with. Really nothing negative to say there. As far as next up though, what is for probably many people the car that they'll try first, the new Nismo GT3. Now this one is going to be controversial because it's essentially a duplicate. It isn't, but it is. You know what I mean. It's an update. Curiously though, it's not so much the idea of a duplicate or an update which annoys me. It's that this car actually doesn't really make any kind of major improvement over the existing model. Because not only is it more expensive at 600 grand instead of 450, 
it's actually a lower performance point than the existing 2013 car. That's a bit odd. <laughs> now, part of the reason why is it has less power at 576, despite weighing less. At 1,285 kilos, overall, it's a GTR, so you kind of know what you're gonna get. The handling is good for the most part, but it is a bit on the big side, a little bit on the heavy and more understeer side at high speeds, but it's a pretty consistent car, and it's a Gran Turismo game, so you always know they're gonna favor GTRs anyway. For me, I have little to no interest in this car, but for those who enjoy it and who, you know, who want to represent the GTR or represent Nismo, sure, go for it, I guess. Again, I'll talk about that one more in its own video. Next up, let's jump to the classic Sphere again, with the KGC 110 Skyline. In my opinion, kind of like a little Japanese equivalent of a muscle car. Looks like a shrunken Dodge Charger. It's only got about 150 horses, 157. Weighs in at 1,100 kilos, which is ironically a lot lighter than the Maserati is, despite being a much taller, boxier, bigger looking car. This one is easily the car of the four that will be probably the most controversial to drive, at least stock you definitely need to tune this car. Because standard, it may as well not have a diff at all in practice. It certainly drives like a car that has a completely locked diff. It's very unstable under heavy braking, and it's not particularly quick to make up for it. So it really hasn't aged that well, <laughs> I will say this car in the game. It's not even as popular, and from what I can remember, I don't really recall many, if any, people talking about this one more than the far more famous 71 shape, I believe it is, Skyline. This one just never got as much attention. It feels every bit as tall and as high center of gravity inclined as it is, which is why I say you definitely need to tune it. Lower it, drop the weight a bit, put it on some better tires, and certainly fit it with a race diff, you'll have a far better time with the car. But standard, it's kind of just ho-hum. And for half a million credits, well, I don't care what badge it's got on it, that's far too high of a price. It should be no more than 50,000, in all honesty. And last, but definitely not least, we have, of course, the Mazda. The Mazda that nobody asked for, nobody needed, but here we are. And again, people say that my idea for a massive update of adding duplicates all in one go is bad, but somehow this is what we're actually getting, and apparently people are happier with this. <laughs> So sure, go ahead and enjoy your new MX-5, I guess, because this thing is, again, barely any different to the normal MX-5. There are two versions of it. One has a livery, one doesn't. Who cares either way? It's an MX-5 with a roll cage, visually speaking. In terms of performance, it is barely any different to the normal MX-5 on paper. It's got like two horsepower more, costs a couple of grand more, and even the point level, which incidentally is lower than the Maserati is at 421, is not that much higher either. Now, sure, it's a pleasant enough car to drive. I beat other vehicles here at Autopolis, so sure, you can win races with it. And if you want to represent your overwhelming love of the Mazda MX-5, as Kaz clearly does by adding it to the game, then again, go for it. But I think for many of us, this car is, if anything, more of an insult than an addition. It is a literal waste of space in the Gran Turismo game, which is why, yet again, I said, why not add everything like this all at once in a massive update and never do this again? Because it, it's just an insult every time they do it. It reeks of filler, because that's exactly what this car is. It's, it's a bread sandwich, you know, there's nothing to it. There is nothing interesting about this car, and I'm not gonna apologize for having that opinion. It's not even called a proper cup car. It doesn't even have the performance of a proper cup car. It's not good enough to be a Group 4 machine. And to top it all off, we already have the infinitely more interesting old school MX-5 cup car, which is a way cooler car than this in every way. So yeah, sure, Kaz added it because he likes the car. Good for you, Kaz. Keep making the game that you want because screw the community, right? Who cares what we want? But that's it for my thoughts overall on this update. I will be talking about the cars individually. And for me, the Maserati is the only thing here that I'm excited about, and I'm glad to see it in. But tell me your thoughts down below. Are you happy with it? Disappointed with it? Maybe a mix of each. And anything that you think I might have missed, mention down there as well. But until next time, I'll see you then with more. And for now, as always, thanks for watching.